Hello again, everyone. Robert Breaker with you today, and this will be our Sermon of the Week. My voice is starting to go out a little bit, so um, I'm going to try to make this to where I'm close to the computer and close to the microphone. Don't want to talk too loud, but I can always turn the volume up later if I need to. Today's sermon is entitled, The Biblical Doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity. Now, I have already done some videos on this subject. You can go to YouTube and type in in YouTube, Robert Breaker, and then these titles. And the videos I've already done are Clarifying the Trinity, The Trinity or the Godhead, Email Denying the Trinity, God in Three Persons, and then the Seven Mystery Series, Mystery of Godliness. I believe that was mystery number one, if I remember correctly. So I've already done some videos on this, but a lot of people are asking me, Brother Breaker, can you do another video on the doctrine of the Trinity? This is one of those harder doctrines in the Bible to understand because it's kind of a mystery. It's how is God and who is God? How can God do what God can do? Well, God can do whatever he wants. That's what makes him God. But all we can do is just believe it. So what I want to do today is I want to come to you through the Word of God. And we're going to go to the Bible. I'm in, of course, the King James Bible. And we're going to go through the Bible, and I'm going to uh, show you what the Bible says. And I hope this will be a blessing to you. And every week I put a new sermon up in English and Spanish on thecloudchurch.org. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take us to Scripture. But I'm also going to take us to history and to the dictionary. And we're going to look at this biblical doctrine of the Trinity or the Godhead. Now, the Bible term is the Godhead, so I'd like to stick with the Bible term as much as possible. Let me get my camera right here. But it's not wrong to use the word Trinity. Now, we're going to start in 1 Corinthians today. Let me make this a little bit bigger for us so we can see it. Uh, 1 Corinthians today. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians, and we're going to look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I would like to read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 through 19. Now, in this I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he says, um, you guys are not in unity, in fellowship. You're not believing the same things. All you're doing is arguing, and that's not right. Verse 18, for first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. So Paul says, now I'm listening to gossip, but uh, knowing who you are, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's true that there are divisions. Instead of trying to edify one another and come together in the truth, all they want to do is attack one another and divide, tear down, instead of edify, which means to build up. Now this verse right here, 1 Corinthians 11:19, 19, is one of the strangest verses in the Bible to me, and it's hard for me to understand this verse. Because he said, for there must also be heresies among you. Now, what a thing to say, that there must be heresy. <laughs> well, good thing it doesn't stop there, because we can understand it by the rest of the verse. But it is an odd verse that Paul says, there must be heresies among you. He says, for there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. What an interesting thing to say. Paul says, there must be heresies. Why? So that those that have the truth can bring to you the truth and point out what the error or the lie or the heresy is. And for me, I see it as this. If there's a heresy in the church or among the body of Christ and someone's preaching a heresy, I look at that and what that does is that makes me go, oh, really? You believe that and you're teaching this, that, or the other thing? Is that true? Well, let me, let me look this up for myself and let me study it for myself to see if that is a truth or if that is a heresy. So the more heresies there are out there, the more it should lead us to study our Bible and not fall into that heresy, rather expose that heresy. And that's what I want to do today. I want to expose the heresy because there are lots of heresies today. One of them is that the doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity is not true. Now, many of your Jehovah Witnesses, your JWs, do not believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. Why is that? Well, I believe there's a reason for that. And I'll probably get into that a little bit. But I want to do this today. I want to look at all of this today. Look at this doctrine of the Trinity or the Godhead. Because there are people out there saying the Trinity is a lie. The Trinity is not a true doctrine. The Trinity is not in the Bible. There's no Trinity. And people that believe in Trinity, the Trinitarians, are heretics. 
Is that true, or could it be the opposite is true, that those that are now attacking the Trinity are the heretics, and they're attacking a sound Bible doctrine? Hmm, let's look at that. So we're going to go today, and we're going to look at uh, many different sources. We're going to look at Scripture, we're going to look at history, and we're even going to look at the dictionary, okay? So what I want to do here first is I want to go to the Internet, and try to pull that up here if I can. Um, I'm using OBS Studio and I'm learning how to use it and it's wonderful, but it's so hard sometimes to get it to work for me the way I want. So here goes nothing. We're gonna go to the dictionary first. Uh, excuse me, to the uh, internet first. And here is the internet definition of the word Trinity. Trinity, the Christian Godhead as one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So. Godhead and Trinity are used interchangeably among many Christian people. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity. Okay, so here we have, now this is Wikipedia, okay, this is one of the first things that shows up. But what is the world saying that it is? Well, they define it as God, as being one God existing in three co-equal, co-eternal, and on and on. So it's one God. Remember that. The Trinity teaching is the teaching of one God. It's not three different gods. <laughs> There's a lie being taught out there that is absolute heresy of people saying, if you believe in the Trinity, you believe in three gods. No, that's not even what this says. The Trinity doctrine is believing in one God, not three gods. Why someone would lie and say that, I don't understand. But that's what that is. That is a lie to teach that the Trinity is three gods. It's the teaching of one God and three, and these three are one. Now, here we have the Trinity as defined by Wikipedia. Now, can you always believe Wikipedia, you know? But I thought, well, let's start there because that's where most people start. When you get into the internet and you type in Trinity, this is probably the first thing that pops up. Now, what does it say? The Christian doctrine of the Trinity defines God as being one God existing in three co-equal, co-eternal, consubstantial divine persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons sharing one essence. All right, I won't try to pronounce that word. In this context, the three persons define who God is, while the one essence defines what God is. The doctrine is called Trinitarianism, and its adherents are called Trinitarians, while opponents are called anti-Trinitarians or non-Trinitarians. Non-Trinitarian positions include Unitarianism. Now look up what Unitarianism is. It denies the blood autonomy of Christ. By Binitarianism, or by Binitarianism, I don't know how to, to say that, Binitarianism and modalism. So there are those that believe in the Trinity doctrine, there are those that are anti-Trinitarians, and many of those on the side of anti-Trinitarianism are on the side of those that deny the blood of Christ. Unitarianism, universalism. Um, that's kind of creepy, is it not? Now we're going to look at a lot of things here, and there's a lot of things that I want to get into in this study, but I just want you to know um, the side that's against the Trinity is the side that denies the blood atonement and even denies that Jesus is God because many of your Jehovah Witnesses deny that Jesus Christ is God. So would you want to belong to a group of people that are against the Trinity who are wrong on other doctrines? The Jehovah Witnesses are wrong on who Jesus is. He's God. They don't believe that. They don't believe in one God and three. And so you've got to be careful. For 1,800 years, Christians have believed in the Trinity or the Godhead of one God in three persons. Now let me show you what the dictionary says here. I'm going to pull up the dictionary in uh, Webster's 1828. And I believe the Webster's 1828 dictionary has to be like the best, right? So let's go to the 1828 Webster's dictionary and look what it says when you type in Trinity, so you go up here and you type in Trinity. Let me do it in lifetime. Trinity. In theology, the union of three persons in one Godhead. Okay, so three persons in one. The dictionary defines the Trinity as one God in three, but he's one. In theology, the union of three persons in one Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now look at the note that he gives in 1828. In my whole essay, essay, in my whole essay, there is not anything like an objection against the Trinity. <laughs> so Noah Webster says in his day, 200 years ago, a little under, 
he says in my whole essay, what is his essay? Well, the entire dictionary. In my whole essay, there's not anything like an objection to the Trinity. Nobody objects to this teaching. All of Christianity agree that, guess what? There's no objection to the doctrine of the Trinity. All Christians believe in one God in three, and these three are one. Now, why do they believe that? Well, because the Bible says it, and I'm going to show you that here in a moment. But before I do, let me go over here to um, the Scriptures, and I want to look this up for you. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And if he said that close to 200 years ago, that there's no objection to the Trinity, there's no denominations, there's no people running around saying, we don't believe in the Trinity. In his day, it was an established doctrine that everybody believed. So they're all in favor of the Trinity. They're all like, yeah, we believe. We believe the Trinity. So what happened? Why do all of a sudden now we have these people who are anti-Trinitarians? What happened? Well, we have to go to the Bible for the answer for what happened. And the Bible tells us plainly in 1 Timothy 4, 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, that's where we are now, the last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So if someone starts changing established Christian doctrine, is that the Holy Spirit in them bringing forth true doctrine <laughs> that we were all just wrong on for all these years? Or could that be a devil bringing about one of their doctrines? Well, that's what it says. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy. So they lie. They go around and they lie, having their conscience seared with a, head iron, a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. What's the only religion that forbids to marry and, and says you can't eat meat on Friday? Well, I won't go there right now, but hmm, that's quite an interesting thing. But the Bible is very clear in this scripture that when someone comes along and begins to change Bible doctrine, that they are under the influence of a seducing spirit and a devil. And they are trying to change Christian doctrine into doctrines of devils. And they are lying because they have their conscience seared with a hot iron. So that is very sad. But that's what the Bible teaches. So back to Webster's, he said, man, in my day, nobody was against the doctrine of the Trinity. We all Christians, we all believe in one God and three, and those three are one. Why would they believe that? Well, first of all, let me say this. The devil hates the doctrine of the Godhead, the biblical doctrine of the Godhead, which we today call the Trinity. By the way, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the word Godhead is. I don't have a problem using words that aren't in the Bible if those words describe a Bible doctrine. For example, the rapture. The word rapture is not in the Bible, but the doctrine is of the snatching away, of the taking out of the church. So the devil hates the Godhead doctrine, and in these last days, he's working overtime to attack it and to try to destroy it. So, the devil is using men, and possibly women as well, to speak lies in hypocrisy. Lie number one. This is one of the first lies that you'll hear from these kind of people. Lie number one. The Trinity doctrine is a Catholic doctrine. So, the Trinity doctrine is a Catholic doctrine. That's lie number one. Just because Catholics believe in a doctrine doesn't mean it's false. Now, there are a lot of what I would call falsehoods in the Catholic Church that I don't agree with, okay? But the Catholic Church believes in the virgin birth, that Mary was a virgin when she had Jesus. Do we throw that out because Catholics believe that? These people, they claim to be Bible believers, and they'll come out and say, you know, the Bible says, the Bible says, and I'm not a Catholic, and the Catholics are wrong, and all the Catholics' doctrine is wrong. Then you're going to have to throw out the doctrine of the virgin birth if you believe that because they believe in the virgin birth. Now, we as Christians can't believe that because they believe that. See, people go to such an extreme that they become extremists. You better be careful. And there are people out there that say, you cannot believe in the Trinity because the Trinity is a Catholic doctrine. And we're not Catholic, so we can't believe that. Well, I'm not a Catholic. And I study what they teach, and I study what the Bible says, and I'm always going to go with the Bible. So if I find something that Catholicism teaches that is not biblical, I'll be the first one to point out I don't agree with that. And we'll get to the end of this um, teaching here. I'm going to show you why I can't go along with the Catholics in their teaching of the Trinity because they mix something with it that I can't, I can't accept. But Catholics believe in one God and three persons. 
Well, why do they believe that? Well, because it's almost to the point where you can't be a Christian unless you say that. <laughs> so they say that. But they add something to it that I can't go along with. And I want to get to that here shortly. But when it comes to the virgin birth, I believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. Catholics say Jesus was born of a virgin. But if you stop right there, we're in agreement. But they don't stop there. Catholics believe she was a perpetual virgin. I read my Bible and I don't see that. I see she had other children after Jesus. So do you see how a lot of times they'll go to an extreme and then people will go to the other extreme? I'm here in the middle with the Bible. I'm not going to either extreme. I'm going to always stick with what the Bible says. Amen. Lie number one is the Trinity is a Catholic doctrine. Now, many of these people that say that, they say, and the Catholic Church started in 325 A.D. So if we were to find the teaching of the Trinity before 325 A.D., then logically we have pointed out their lie. Now, the Catholics will tell you, we don't believe we started in 325 A.D. We believe we go all the way back to Peter. They believe he's the first pope. And so they'll, they'll say we, we are the oldest religion. Well, there's the Baptists. <laughs> John the Baptist was first. Now, John wasn't a Baptist like modern-day Baptists, but um, they leave out Paul for some reason as well. But the true Christian church starts with Jesus Christ, not with Peter. Okay, It's called the body of Christ, not the body of Peter, not the body of Paul. So true Christianity believes in Jesus, but then we also see the apostles, but we also see why Paul is the most important. Because through him is the doctrine of justification by faith alone, saved by faith, grace through faith not works. Catholicism teaches a faith and works. So they really depart a lot from the Bible in their teachings. But there are people out there that attack the Trinity and they say because Catholics believe it. Okay. Catholicism officially, I'm going to use it this way, officially started in 325 AD with Constantine mixing Roman pagan state with the church. And then he officially started that with his decree of 325 A.D. So if we look at that, 325 A.D., the Council of Nicaea, as the official beginning of the Catholic's doctrine, if you will, then when did the word Trinity appear? If, if Catholicism started the doctrine of the Trinity, and the Trinity is a Catholic doctrine, then it would have started then, right? Not before. The problem is we go to the Internet and we find some things that tell us, guess what? Before 325 A.D., we have, <laughs> guess what, people believing in the Trinity doctrine. Um, here is gotquestions.org. It seems that the church father Tertullian, A.D. 160 to 225, well, that's before 325 A.D., was the first to apply the term Trinity to God. Tertullian uses the term in against praxius written in 2.13, to explain and defend the Trinity against the teaching of his contemporary, Praxius, who espoused the Monarchian heresy. From there, we can jump forward over a century of church discussion, schisms, and debate to the Council of Nicaea when the Trinity was finally confirmed as official church doctrine. So, according to what this says, the Trinity became the official doctrine of the church in 325 A.D., of the Catholic Church. Now, I'm not a Catholic. I believe the true church existed before Catholicism, and it exists today, and it is outside of Catholicism. I've always believed that. But there was someone who used the term before 325 AD, before official Catholic Church doctrine. <laughs> hmm. So, is someone lying if they come to you and say that the Trinity is a Catholic doctrine and the Catholics started it? If there was someone before the official forming of Catholic doctrine that taught it, wouldn't that be a lie spoken in hypocrisy? Now, the word Trinity in the Greek language is triada, um, but the word doesn't appear in the Greek text of the Texas Receptus or any of the other perverted ones, nor does it appear in, you know, um, in the Bible. The word triada or Trinity is not in our English Bible. But the men used that word to describe what they saw as one God in three, and these three were one. So I wanted to point that out to you. Um, also, even before that, a brief history. This is a Theopedia, and I don't know many of these places, but I just I wanted to give you some examples of this. The Trinity was formally stated in the Nicene Creed. Okay, well, they had to find some Christianity in order to be called Christianity. 
and then they form their doctrine mixing it with the Roman papal state. Again, the term Trinity is not found in the Bible. We know that, okay? The word Trinity is not found in the Bible. But Theophilus of Antioch around 1 AD, AD first used the Greek term trias, a set of three, in reference to God, his word, and his wisdom. So there was a man in Antioch. Well, you know what? That's where uh, the disciples of Christ were first called Christians, in Antioch of Assyria. And there was a guy named Theophilus. Well, in the Bible, Luke says, oh, most noble Theophilus. Is that the same guy? I don't know. Probably not. That seems like it's a lot later. But Theophilus of Antioch used the term trias in reference to God, saying God is three, but yet those three are one. Tertullian in 215 AD was the first one to state this doctrine using the Latin term trin trinitas, which sounds like our modern term trinity. So I wanted to come to you and, and show you all of these things because I want you to see it for yourself. I've noticed lately that a lot of people just believe whatever they're here on YouTube. If they see a video on YouTube and someone says something, they take it for granted, that guy's telling you the truth. You've got to be careful. That guy might be lying to you. And this is an outrageous lie spoken in hypocrisy. And it is a doctrine of a devil to say that the Trinity is a Catholic doctrine. Okay? It clearly was believed by the early church. Now, what is the Trinity doctrine? It's believing in one God who can manifest in three, but yet those three are only one God. That is the doctrine of the Trinity. And it is found in Scripture. So let's go to the Scripture. And a lot of these people that are against the Trinity will either ignore this verse or will attack this verse and say this verse shouldn't be in the Bible. Your Jehovah Witnesses, in their Bible, they change this verse. I don't remember if they take out the entire verse or most of it. But they do attack this verse and say, we don't believe this verse. And the lie, there's another lie, in modern scholarship today is 1 John 5, 7 shouldn't be in the Bible because it wasn't in the early manuscripts. Do you know that's a lie? If you go to the Greek manuscripts and you take out 1 John 5, 7, the grammatical um, syntax is not correct. It only reads correct grammatically in the Greek language with verse 7. So someone took this verse out. You have a bunch, you have hundreds of the early church fathers quoting 1 John 5, 7, 100, 200, 300 years after Jesus, before what they call the oldest text, which were 400 to 600 years after Jesus. So clearly 1 John 5, 7 has always been in the Bible, and it is Bible. But the Jehovah Witnesses want to cast doubt on it and say, no, no, it wasn't in the originals, when it clearly was. Otherwise, why would they be, why would they be quoting it, right? Others will just simply ignore it. Look what it says. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Now, who's the Word? Jesus Christ, John 1, 1, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are three. Is that what it says? No, it says these three are one. I'm going to leave that up there for you. So the Bible teaches the biblical doctrine of one God in three, but those three are one. Now, another lie you'll hear from these people is, well, if you believe in the Trinity, you believe in three gods. Well, you are lying, and the dictionary proved that. You're not telling me the truth. We went to other sources historically. That's not what they believed. And now we're looking at Scripture, and it says the doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity is one God in three, but those three are one. I don't believe in three gods, but these people are trying to deceive you into thinking if a man is a Trinitarian and believes in the doctrine of the Trinity, he believes in three gods. That's a lie from the pits of hell, and you need to know who these liars are, and you'll recognize them when you see them. They are lying to you about the doctrine of the Trinity. One God in three. Three in one and one in three, and the one in the middle died for me, is an old saying that my old pastor used to say. So the Trinity doctrine, or let's call it biblically the Godhead, because that's the term the Bible uses, the Godhead is one God in three, but those three are one. It's unity in one. Three in one. So God is able to manifest himself in three separate ways, and yet still be one God, but who can manifest in three. Now let's look at some more scripture. I want you to see all this from the Bible for yourself. I don't want you to fall into heresy. I don't want you to fall into the 
cult that is known as the JWs. And I don't want you to fall into another cult of people that claim to be King James Bible believers, but they're not even reading the King James. And I'll prove that to you because the King James teaches a Godhead or a Trinitarian belief in one God in three, but those three are one. And we just saw it right here in 1 John 5, 7. But now let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and look at verse 26. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 and 27. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. What is this? Who talks like that? Let us. Well, if it's us, who is speaking? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. That's not three different gods. That's one God. It's, it doesn't say, and God's said. <laughs> It says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he him. So God created man in his own likeness. And he referred to himself as us and our. Hmm. Almost sounds like there must be three. But we know that can't be three separate gods. So that must be one God. But he's talking to themselves. Somehow God can manifest himself in three different places at once and still be one God. Dare we call it three persons? Perhaps. Now, God made man in his image. What is man? Well, do you know man consists of three parts? First um, Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. The old age-old debate, is God one God in three parts or is God one God in three persons? Well, it's actually both, actually, because God can have three parts that consist of who he is and what makes him up, just as we do. But God can also manifest himself in three separate persons. Now, I don't know, can we do that? Do you realize, though, that at death, your body's left behind, but your soul leaves? In heaven, they look at your soul up in heaven, they go, hey, who's that person? Somebody comes to your funeral down here, they go, who's that person? Does that make two completely different persons in the sense that that's two people? <laughs> Are you two different people or three different people? Because you consist of three? No, you're one. But that one consists of three. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray God, listen to this, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we consist of a spirit, a soul, and a body. So we are three in one. And the Bible clearly teaches these three are one. So do you realize that you are one? You consist of three parts though. Did you understand that? Do you, do you do you get that? If you don't, you might be following someone who's a heretic who is lying to you. Now let's go over here and let's look this up. My old pastor, Dr. Peter Ruckman, had a book years ago that he wrote called Body, Soul, and Spirit. And he explains all this. If you get a chance to get that book, well, maybe it'll do you good to have it. It's a great book, Body, Soul, and Spirit by Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. And he explains how we have a body, we have a soul, we have a spirit. But yet we're one. And you look at that, you understand what man is. He's in the physical world, his flesh. And he's in the spiritual world, he has a spirit. And the thing tying him to the two is his soul. And the soul goes to one of two different places when you die, either heaven or hell. So we consist of three, but yet we're one, according to what the Bible says. So the Bible teaches a trinity, which is one God in three persons. And these three are one. And we are in God's image, so we are three in one. We are a triune being, if you will. So the Bible teaches a trinity or a triune or a triunion, I guess would be a better way to say it, a triunion of God. Interesting enough, the word Godhead, which is the word used in the Bible instead of Trinity, you know, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Interestingly enough, I find this so amazing, the word Godhead is in the Bible three times. Let me type it in for you, Godhead. Three times, Acts 17, 29, um, Romans 1, 20, and Colossians nine. Hopefully you can see these in Colossians 2.9. So according to the Bible, we find the Godhead. Um, were you able to see those? I couldn't tell. Hopefully you were. Let me just give you those references again in case you couldn't see them. The references are Acts 17.29, 
Romans 1.20 and Colossians 2.9. And I want to make sure that you uh, have those. And you see Godhead in the Bible, in a capital G. How about that? Because why? It's one God. It's not three different gods. You know, in the English language, uh, we spell God with a capital G. And if it's a false God or another God, which we look at as a demon or a fallen angel, it's a lowercase g. So here's Godhead in the Bible three times. Three in one. In interesting enough that God uses the term Godhead three times to show us, hey, guess what? He's one God in three. So there's some lies out there. And let's look at the Webster's 1828 Dictionary for funsies, okay? Look over here at the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, and this is the term Godhead. Look what it says in the 1828 Dictionary speaking of the Godhead. Godship, deity, divinity, divine nature or essence applied to the true God and to heathen deities. A deity in a person, it says, a deity in person, a god or goddess. Now, some people look at this and they lie to you and say, well, if you believe in one God and three persons, a person is the God himself. So to make God a God in three persons makes God into three distinct different gods because a God is a person. And they'll go to this definition in the dictionary. What have they done? They have proven their ignorance because let's go to another uh, definition in the 1828 dictionary, let's go to the definition of the word triune. Here is triune. Triune in the 1828 dictionary. You ready for this? Three in one. <laughs> An epithet applied to God to express the union of the Godhead in a trinity of persons. So he can be more than one person and still be one Godhead according to the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. Do you believe the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, do you? you? You try to go to it sometimes, don't you? To try to um, teach what you teach, but yet you won't go to the other definition. A triune God is one God in three persons, but the fact that he's three persons that are separate does not make him three different gods. It makes him still one God who is able to manifest himself in three persons. So, according to the definition of the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, a great dictionary, by the way, because it defines terms and it often gives verses in the Bible and how it's used in the King James Bible, defines triune as a unity of the Godhead and a trinity of persons. So, the trinity can be persons, but still be one God, according to the dictionary. So, question, is God three parts or three persons? That's a good question. I think you could apply that to both. He can be three separate persons the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. But he can also make himself manifest in three separate persons, but he's still one God. And the three persons are Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but yet the three parts, he can still be three parts. He's the Father, he's the Son, he's the Holy Spirit. God the Father would correspond with the soul. God the Son would correspond with man's body. And God the Holy Spirit would correspond with the spirit in man, because man is three, but one. So God is three in one. He created man as image, Adam, three parts in one. But man is not three separate persons, okay? Man can't do what God does, so man can't be God, right? But we can divide ourselves through death. Don't do it. But when you die, you are manifesting in two different worlds at once. Your body is still in the, uh, your body is still in the material, uh, physical world, while your spirit goes to the spirit world and your soul. So you are literally in two places at once. And you're manifesting in two places at once. People on earth see your body and they cry, I miss this person so much. People in heaven see your soul if you go to heaven or if you go to hell. People in hell see your soul and they say, who's this person? So you're really in two different persons, aren't you? But you're still the same person. But yet you're manifesting in two ways and you're seen as two different persons at once. Do you understand that? So maybe the question is, if God is three persons, does that mean that he's three different gods? And the answer is no. He is one God. He's still the same God, but he can divide himself into three different places or three different persons. At one, persons. I call it three different manifestations of God. He can manifest himself in three different ways at once. Now, here's another lie that these people give. The people that are anti-Trinitarians will lie to you and say, if you believe in one God and three persons, you believe in three gods. Because to them, the word person means one. 
And so they say to say God in three persons is to make three different gods. I've showed you how that is not possible, according to the dictionary, according to the English language, according to who God is. He can still be one God and yet manifest himself in three different ways. And each one of those can be viewed as a separate person in the sense that one is in the person of a father, one is in the person of a son, and one is in the person of the spirit of that one God. And yet it's still one God. It's not three separate gods. But they'll lie. Nope, it's three gods. How do you, how do you argue with the second grader? who won't look at logic and scripture and the dictionary and the English language. You can't. So, reject the heretic after the second admonition and bye-bye. See you later. Or when we may be at the judgment. Uh, and I'd sure hate to be in your shoes because you're on the wrong side because you're going against the scripture. But the lie that they'll give you, and many of them say, I claim to be a King James Bible believer. And they're not. But the lie that they will give you is this. The lie they'll say is, if you believe in the Trinity, you believe in three gods and not one God. Because God cannot be three persons and still be one God. He's three gods now. Okay. Do you realize that the King James Bible calls the Father God a person? It calls Jesus Christ a person. And the Holy Spirit is personified. If it's in the King James Bible, I believe it. Let me just state this. I do not believe in the doctrine of the Godhead, the biblical doctrine of the Godhead, which we call the Trinity. I do not believe in that because the Catholic Church believes that. And I do not believe in that because they taught me. They didn't teach me that. I learned it from a King James Bible. And I believe it because 1 John 5, 7 says there's three, but those three are one. And those three can manifest themselves in three separate persons. Now, how God does that, I don't know. All I know is that he does. So let's go to some scripture real quick, and let me show you that. Let me show you from a King James Bible that the Father is called a person, and the Son is called a person, and the Holy Spirit is personified as a separate person. And because of that, I believe in one God in three persons, but I believe that these three are one, and he's only one God. He's not three different gods. Starting with Hebrews chapter uh, 1 and verse 3. Speaking of the Son, Jesus Christ, speaking of God the Father, chapter 1, says of Jesus Christ in verse 3, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 up there, chapter 1, verse 1, verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, who's that? The Son. So the Son is the brightness of his glory. Who's his? God the Father, right there. Jesus Christ, who being the brightness of his glory, who's that? The Father's glory, and the express image of his, who's he? His is the Father, God the Father up here, because the context is the Son is Jesus, so the Father is God the Father. That's not two separate gods, that's one God in two different manifestations. And the express image of His what? Person. <laughs> so God the Father is a person, and Jesus is in the express image of the person of God the Father. So Jesus Christ is a person, and we'll see that here in a minute, but the Father is a person. So the Father is called a person in our King James Bible, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus himself purged our sins. So Jesus, God the Son, came here to die while God the Father was in heaven because Jesus himself in the person of the Son paid for our sins. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Now, let's look at another verse. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 2. All right. If you're a King James Bible believer, you'll be on the same page as me. I know. If you're not, you're getting angry not right now. You're getting upset. Well, my minister, my teacher said, uh-huh. Are you following the Bible? Or are you following a liar who is speaking lies and hypocrisy and trying to teach you a doctrine of devils? I think we should stick with the King James Bible, don't you, if you're a King James Bible believer? Paul says this. Look what he says. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also, for I... For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Who is Christ? Christ Jesus. So Jesus Christ is a person, the person of Christ. So Jesus Christ is a person. So God the Father is called a person. Now here Jesus Christ the Son is called a person. Now let's go to John chapter 14. Now you will see people who are against this teaching, who are against the doctrine of the Trinity, mock me, make fun of me, and laugh at what I'm teaching you right now. 
I'm just simply showing you what the King James Bible says. So please don't make this about me or about them. Make it about the Bible. And do you choose to follow what the Bible says? Jesus says this in John 14, 16, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Look how that's a capital C. Hmm. Personification, that's called in the English language. And the comforter we know is the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And he shall give you another comforter. Oh, so not Jesus himself, it's another. But yet we know it's the Holy Spirit of Jesus, it's the Spirit of Christ. So it's one God, but he's in three separate manifestations. And he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Now, Scroll down with me with, well, if you're using it on your computer, but turn in your Bible if you're looking there. Uh, John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. So that's a person, the Holy Ghost. He's personified as the Comforter, but it's capital H, capital G. And 1 John 5, 7 says these three are one. You know, another lie they'll tell you is, well, you believe in two gods. <laughs> No, I believe in one God in three, but those three are one. Do they believe the King James Bible? When they talk the way they do and say, I'm a King James Bible believer, bless God, and no, the King James Bible doesn't teach the Trinity. It doesn't teach one God in, in three persons. Do you believe that load of junk? Do you believe that lie? I don't. I identify those as being led by devils to try to deceive you into believing a lie. Because the Bible clearly teaches one God in three persons. And that doesn't make three gods. That makes one God who can manifest himself in three separate persons, but still be one God. Now, I forgot to read this to you. Let me just read this. Mark chapter 12. Here's another one. This is a good one. Mark chapter 12. Another one to show you. Uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 31. Mark 12, 31. And let's see. 31 through 32. Well, that's not the one I want. So let me, I'm going to have to, on the fly here. Um, uh, let's see. Blasphemy. Blasphemy of the there we go. It's Matthew. All right. Sometimes I do that. Amen. It makes me look real. Amen. I'm a real person. I do make mistakes sometimes. Amen. But when it comes to what the Bible says, man, I'm going to follow what it says because it never makes mistakes. Amen. The Bible has no mistakes, I believe, at least the King James. Jesus is speaking and he says in Matthew 12, 31, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. Well, the Son of Man, that's the Son of God, that's Jesus. He referred to himself as the Son of Man and the Son of God. The two natures, the divine nature, and then he took on the form of man, yet without sin. It shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor in the world to come. Now, who can forgive sins but God alone? So the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, must be God. And I believe it is. So, does the Bible teach this lie that they are saying? There are people out there that are lying to you and saying, if a person is a Trinitarian, they believe in three separate gods, and they have a belief of believing in three gods in three different persons. Folks, that is an outright lie and heresy. The Bible teaches one God in three persons, and these three are one. And those people are lying to you, and causing division and strife in the body of Christ, and are guilty of satanic heresies and demonically led heresies of, of doctrines of devils. Okay? I don't know how else to say it, except the way the Bible does. Is it biblical to speak of God as one God in three persons? Yes, it is. Now, I, I could go here. I don't like to get into these old, silly, made-up, um, arguments, okay? I'm not going to argue these made-up arguments that many argue um, from hundreds of years ago or whatever. So I'm going to go with what the Bible says, but I did want to show you this. I find this interesting. Here is a um, site, Bible.org, and uh, this is an excerpt from Basic Theology by Charles Ryrie. Ryrie? Ryrie? I think I'm saying that right. 
He said, the early church fathers did not formulate any clear statement concerning the Trinity. Some were unclear about the logos. Now, logos is, is a Greek word, uh, and it means the word of God. And most were unconcerned about giving attention to spirit except for the work in the lives of believers. In answer to Praxius, Tartelian asserted, he's 165 to 220, the, the threeness aspect of God, being the first to use the word Trinity. However, he did not have a full and accurate understanding of the Trinity. Okay, fine. His views being tinged with subordinationism. Tertullian was battling monarchians who opted for the unity of God and denied Trinitarianism. Marcionism existed in two forms. So you had all these people back then that were heretics calling each other different names. <laughs> Why didn't they just get on the same page as the Bible? Dynamic monarchianism or adoptionism was first expounded by Theodosius of Byzantium about 210 and viewed Jesus as a man who was given special power by the Holy Spirit at his baptism. So Jesus is just a man. He's not God manifest in the flesh. That's a problem. That can't be true. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. I'll show you those verses. Modalistic monarchianism. This was more influ influential, attempting not only to maintain the unity of God, but also the full deity of Christ by asserting that the Father became incarnated in the Son. Now we're going to an opposite extreme. In the West, it is known as patriopassianism. Patriopassianism. Since the incarnated Father also suffered in the Son. And in the East, as Sabellianism, after its most famous representative who taught that the persons in the Godhead were modes in which God manifested himself through Sibelius. Though Sibelius used the word person, he meant it as a role or manifestation of the one divine essence. Okay? What, what is this? These people were battling over this way back then, before it finally got settled. What is the right way to believe? Well, do you believe the Father was in the Son when he suffered? We just read a verse in Hebrews that Jesus Christ himself suffered. <laughs> he said, I and my Father are one. Yes, because they're one God. But they're separate manifestations of that one God in separate persons. And in the person of Christ, Jesus died on the cross. And guess what happened? The Father in heaven looked down and he was pleased with the sacrifice. So I don't want to dredge up all these ancient you know, arguments, I think they're silly. I think we should just always have our uh, agreement in what the Bible says. Not go back and say, well, what did this man say about it? Well, what did this man say about it? Well, what did this guy say about it? I think that's ridiculous. I don't care about what a man says that he thinks the Trinity is. What does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches one God in three. These three are one. And it tells us right there in 1 John 5, 7, I got it right up there, that that's the Father, the Word, that's Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. It says it, I believe it, that settles it, right? End of discussion? Well, unfortunately, no for some people. They go, no, no, we believe there's only one and it's Jesus. And so when Jesus was here, the Holy Spirit was in him and the Father was in him. And so that's where God was in one place. He can't be one God in three different persons. Oh, he can't, can he? Can we show you in the King James Bible? I mean, would, would you believe it if you saw it in Scripture? I mean, you claim to be a King James Bible believer. Would you even believe what the King James says? Let's go to the King James Bible. Math, uh, Matthew chapter 3. Jesus Christ is here on earth. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. So here's the body of Jesus coming up. And lo, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. So here's the Holy Spirit coming down from heaven. Where was it? In heaven. Where's Jesus? Down here. So it comes down and comes inside of Jesus. And verse 17, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Who is this? The Father in heaven. It says it right there. Speaking and saying, This is my... Is the Father in the Son right there? Or is the Father in heaven? Or is it the fact that the Father and the Son are one? They're all one, no matter where they're manifesting. They're still one. I think that's what it's saying. Uh, John chapter 12. Look at this, John chapter 12. I don't know what to say, folks. I do not understand why people say what they say. But there's a lot of people out there that are believing in heresy. And they're trying to make you believe them rather than believe the Bible. And this is how that works. They go around and say, if anybody believes in the Trinity, they're a heretic. Don't listen to them. Maybe you should study your Bible. And maybe you should think, huh, I wonder if this guy is trying to deceive me. Let's go to the scriptures. 
John chapter 12, verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. This is Jesus on earth speaking. Usually when it's red letter like that, uh, there's a thing called a red letter Bible, and the red letters are the words of Jesus. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Where did that voice come from? From heaven. Who would that have been in heaven? God the Father. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to, the, to him. Isn't that interesting? Well, we know who it was. It was the Father. Okay? The Father spoke from heaven just like he did back in Matthew. Let's go to one more, Luke chapter 23. Here's Jesus on the cross. Luke chapter 23 and verse 46. Luke 23, 46. And we read, And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And being thus said, he gave up the ghost. Would that be the Holy Ghost? Where is the Holy Ghost going to go? Is it going back up to the Father? I mean, that's what it sounds like. So there are people out there that will not listen to truth and will not accept that God can do whatever God wants to do because he's God. And they will not accept that God can be one God in three persons. And they don't accept that. But the Bible teaches that. And I've showed you the verses. Now, is Jesus Christ God? Yes. And we're going to look at some verses on that. But I don't want to get caught up in man's arguments. I just want to go by what the Bible says. And the Bible says it's one God who can manifest himself in three separate ways. But yet he can still be one God. And he is. Now, clearly Jesus Christ is God. Quickly, I want to run through these verses. Now, your Jehovah Witness people, they say, no, Jesus isn't God. Well, here we go again. And you know what's funny is some of these verses are changed in their versions showing you that maybe they changed it on purpose because they don't want people to believe it. But if you read your Bible, look what it says. Behold a virgin, uh, virgin, I always say virgin, I don't know, I just, I say it too fast. Behold a virgin, oh, I'll say it slower. Behold a virgin, a virgin, shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. Now this is a prophecy from way back in the Old Testament. Behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpret, interpreted is God with us. Gott mit uns in German. Dios con nosotros. So who is Jesus Christ? He is God in the flesh here on earth. How can anyone deny that? But some of your anti-Trinitarians, they deny that Jesus is God. And that's the Jehovah Witnesses. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, 16. Great is the mystery of godliness, it says here. Okay. And look what it says. And without controversy. <laughs> Why is this a controversy? In the Bible, there's no controversy. Maybe someone's not in the Bible. Maybe that's why they're stirring up this controversy. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, judged in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, and believed on in the world, received up into glory. So Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Is God in the flesh. All right? Is manifested in the flesh. Now, Holy Spirit is also God. Did you know that? Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 and look at verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Hmm. Look what he says. Thou hast not lied unto man, but unto God. He just said the Holy Ghost. What is he saying? Is he saying the Holy Ghost is God? Yeah, yeah, that's what he's saying. The Holy Spirit of the Holy Ghost is God. Now let's go to John chapter 6. And in John chapter 6, we know that the Father is God. John chapter 6 and verse 27. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Hath God the Father? God the Father. So is there is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's the way we speak of them in their separate manifestations or their separate persons. We're not making three different gods when we refer to one as God the Father, one to God the Son. We're not have, we, we do not speak of three gods. We're speaking of one God, but he's God manifesting as, in this sense, the Father. In this sense, it's the Son. In this sense, it's God in the form of the Holy Spirit. So the Trinity doctrine, all right? Let me go back to 1 John 5, 7. 1 John 5, 7. So the doctrine of the Godhead, or the Trinity, is a biblical doctrine. How anyone who claims to believe in the King James Bible could be against the doctrine of the Trinity, I don't understand. They must be being led by demons. That's the only thing that the only conclusion that I can come to. 
So the Trinity doctrine, or let's call it what the Bible calls it, the doctrine of the Godhead, one God in three persons, is biblical. It's Bible-based, but the Bible word is Godhead. So if you want to never use the word Trinity and only refer to it as the Godhead, you know you can do that. You can choose what words you use. But when I use a word, I want to define that word. And to me, when I use the term Godhead, I'm talking of the Trinity. And when I use the term Trinity, I'm talking of the biblical Godhead, which I believe, I'm defining terms now, is one God in three, and these three are one, as it says right there, 1 John 5, 7. And I believe what the Bible says. Now you have to be careful as Satan is attacking this doctrine. He hates God and who he is and what he does. Thus he has mixed with the doctrine of the Trinity something awful. He's going to use men to attack the doctrine of the Trinity, and he's doing that. But within Christianity, well, let me rephrase that, within those that claim to be Christians, he's going to try to take the doctrine of the Trinity and mix it with something of his. And he has done that. He has mixed the doctrine of the Trinity with something awful and something evil, something satanic. Do you know what the devil has done? The devil has taken the doctrine of the Godhead and he has mixed it with a symbol that is his symbol. And when you go to the Catholic religion and Catholicism claims to be the one true religion. Now, I believe that true Christianity is Bible based and there has always existed from the time of the early apostles, true Christians who never joined in with that pagan Rome uh, um, Christianity of 325 AD and the Council of Nicaea. There's always been believers that have been outside and said, no, we're not going to mix with the Roman Catholic Church. We're true believers, though, but we're following the Bible. I believe Roman Catholicism is a paganized, apostatized form of Christianity. If that offends you, fine. But please don't turn this off until you see what I show you, because it will shock you, because this is truth, and I believe you need to hear the truth. What that church has done has mixed in with the doctrine of Trinity a pagan symbol. And without further ado, let me just go ahead and show you that symbol, okay? I want you to see this symbol of the Godhead. And this is a pagan symbol. And there's a name for this symbol. It's called the triketa. Triketra. I can't even say it. See, I never use this term. As a true Christian, I never use this symbol, and I never use this word. So, I don't talk about this. But this is a symbol that is used in the Catholic Church, and they claim that this is representative of the doctrine of the Trinity. Triketria. Triketria. The Triketria. I can't even say it. See, this, this is so foreign to me that this is not something that I as a Christian want anything to do with. I don't want to use this symbol. I don't even want to use the word. The, the Triketra, from the Latin Triketras, three cornered, is a triangular figure composed of three interlaced arcs, or equivalently three overlapping visia piscis, lens shapes. It is used as an ornament designed in architecture and medieval manuscript illumination. And it goes on there, and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a knot. Now, if you continue reading, you can look at what it ties into, but you know what? It has tradition in Buddhism. It has been known as a symbol in Japan called Musubi Mitsugashiwa, being one of the forms of the Aryan Aikisaku dynasty signs. It reached Japan with the dynasty's spreading theology and Buddhism via the kingdom of Khotan and China and Korea. So is Buddhism Christianity? Buddhism has to do with idol worship. Did you know that? It's also known as a Trinity knot, and it has to do with the Celtic people. Do you know the Celtic people were pagans? Do you know that those Celtic people uh, used pagan symbols? And uh, they had pagan deities? But did you know that they, they had what they called the Druids, which were their priests that ac actually used satanic sacrifices? So this symbol was all over the pagan world. Now this is going to shock you. And maybe it should. Go to the internet and just type in what I did. I guess I'm over here on Yahoo. Witchcraft symbol Trinity. And the first thing that pops up is 25 witchcraft symbols everyone should know. And by the way, 
this symbol is is shown in a lot of places. Let me see if I can find it in images. Um, they usually add more to it like this. And it looks even more Celtic because the Celts were pagans. But you click on 25 witchcraft symbols and for sake of time I went down and I've looked at them all and look at this symbol. The Triketra is a satanic symbol is used in witchcraft. The triketra means triangle in Latin. The symbol is used in the Christian tradition to refer, refer to the Holy Trinity. No, sir. No. Not my Christian tradition of Bible-based. This comes from that other line of Christianity that has mixed pagan Rome with Christianity and officially did so in 325 AD. So I, as a true Christian, do not accept this symbol. In Wicca, that's witchcraft, this version of a Celtic knot is used to refer to the three realms, earth, wind, and sky, or mind, body, and soul. So do you see this as it is a satanic symbol? I do. So why would anyone want that symbol in their church? But yet you go to the Catholic church and you see that symbol in Catholicism. That is not a Christian symbol. That is a symbol of of witchcraft. And don't you know there is a new version of the Bible out there that uses this symbol? What version is that? It's a version that I am very much against. People ask me all the time, Brother Breaker, should I use the New King James Bible? Is the New King James the same as the King James? No. This is the front of the New King James Version of the Bible. And look what they put on there. This witchcraft, satanic symbol that is not a true Christian symbol. Uh, what I call fake modern Christianity has taken this pagan symbol and tried to introduce it into Christianity. And I do not concur. I do not go along with that. And I do not accept that symbol, their trinity. I mean, to me, that's a satanic trinity. You know, in the Bible, there's a satanic trinity. And in the Bible, the satanic trinity is the dragon, the um, beast, and then the false prophet. So Satan has a trinity. Isn't that wild? And it's an imitation of the true trinity of God. But the New King James Bible uses this symbol, the triketra, or however you say it, which is a symbol, according to witches, that they use in Wicca. Do you think we need to put satanic witchcraft symbols on Bibles? I don't. People ask me, Brother Breaker, is the New King James Bible a good translation? I say no. You know why I don't use the New King James translation? It did use the critical text in its translation, which come from... Um, a text known as the Nestle Allen text, which is a text of Bible societies that mix with the Pontifical Institute of Rome. And the Pontifical Institute of Rome uses the Nestle Allen text, which is a text from Westcott and Hort, so-called Christians, but they were really closet Catholics. And it is a version that comes from perversions. It comes from the critical text from Alexandria, Egypt which was the Gnostic text. So the, you start studying new versions of the Bible, they come from the false text, from the perverted text. And these versions of the Bible come from the critical text, which aren't true text. But the New King James Bible, it did use those critical texts. It claims to come from the right text that the King James comes from, but it doesn't. They changed some things. They mixed in very little, but they did mix in some of the critical text, which tie back to Rome. Hmm. But the New King James, James uh, Version of the Bible, you know what it does? It takes out the word study in 2 Timothy 2.15. The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So why would you want a Bible that has a witchcraft symbol on the very front? Now let me show you another thing about this symbol that is scary you can clearly find 666 in this symbol. That's why witches love this symbol. A lot of witches will have tattoos and this thing. It goes back to the Druids, but also ties into the Roman Catholic Church because the Roman Church was involved in setting up the text that the New King James had on their table, the Nestle Island. So it's all tied together, folks. So why does the Roman Catholic Church use this symbol of the Trinity? I adamantly reject this symbol as a symbol of witchcraft. And as a Christian, I don't want this symbol. So I don't want a Bible that has this symbol on it. Okay? Now, this might have been shocking to some of you. And I hope it is. 
because we should study these things out. You see people going to extremes on these things. Some go to such an extreme, they say, and so if you're a Christian, you can't believe in the Trinity. No, you can use the word as a Christian if you're believing in a one God and three persons, and you're believing in that correctly according to the King James Bible. But you better be careful, because you can be getting into a branch of Christianity that uses a symbol connected with that doctrine that is satanic, pagan in origin, and has to do with witchcraft. Does the Bible tell us? To hook up with a heathen? Does the Bible tell us to get into witchcraft? Does the Bible tell us it's okay to mix things of the world with the things of God? Not in your life. So I reject the symbol that modern Christians use of the Trinity. And I don't want anything to do with that satanic symbol. Jesus said this, Be ye not equally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I want to be separate from anybody that has mixed the doctrine of the Trinity with a satanic symbol. And when you go to the Catholic Church, you see that symbol all over. So I don't want to be a part of that. I want to come out from them and be, a, and be separate, as the Bible says. I want to believe in the true doctrine because of the Bible. I don't want a doctrine watered down with satanic symbols. I don't want a Bible that has that satanic symbol. The Bible says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. So wake up, people. Don't have anything to do with these people that have mixed a Bible doctrine with a pagan symbol. Be careful of that. So watch out for those who deny the Trinity. That's See, it's always an extreme, extremist. Watch out for those who deny the Trinity altogether and say it's not a Bible doctrine. They've gone to one extreme, and they're lying to you. And they're in false doctrine. Now they're in heresy. And don't go to those that say, we believe in the Trinity, and then mix it with a pagan symbol. Now you're gone to the other extreme. Where should you be? You should be in the Bible and say, I believe in the Bible doctrine of the Godhead, the one God in three persons, and these three are one, 1 John 5, 7. But I refuse to go with this crowd that rejects it, and I refuse to go to this crowd that mixes it with satanic witchcraft by that symbol. And that's the right place to be. Usually you want to be right in the middle and not go to one extreme or another. Because the Bible says a false balance is an abomination unto the Lord. And there's a lot of unbalanced people out there that are going to extremes. And they're falling into heresy. And even satanic oppression and doctrines of devils, if you will, by going to one extreme or another. So I don't know what else to do, but just tell you what the Bible says. I'm going to close with some verses real quick, and then I'll be done. And I think I've done my absolute best to present to you what the Bible teaches. I gave you the true doctrine of the Trinity, and then I've warned you, don't go with those that are anti-Trinitarian, because they're throwing out the baby with the bathwater, right? They're, they're burning down the house with the baby in it, if you will. They're choosing to deny a Bible doctrine. Well, that's going the wrong way. But also don't go with those that have mixed that doctrine with a pagan symbol of witchcraft. I don't understand why they would do that. Do you understand that? Second Peter chapter 1, the Bible says this, and it's a warning. But there were many false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Yep, watch out for them. Who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. A lot of these people that are out there attacking the doctrine of the Trinity, it's all for money. They want your money. Don't give your money to people that are teaching a false doctrine. Don't give your money to them. And don't give your money to the other side that says, no, no, come to us. We believe the Trinity. 
But then they're like, now take this Bible. <laughs> By the way, we mixed in witchcraft with the doctrine of the Trinity. He, he, he. Come on over to us. Aren't they bad too? Hmm. Be careful who you follow. Follow the Bible. Jude chapter 1. Of course, there's only one chapter. Verse 3. Beloved, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus, and our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you deny the Lord God and the Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ? How do you deny? Well, it says they're denying him. The other place it says they, they're denying him who bought them. So the faith, what is our faith in? The blood of Christ. A lot of these people are blood deniers. They deny the blood of Jesus. Should you follow such people? No. We need to point them out. We need to expose them. You need to warn people, watch out for this person. He denies Bible doctrine. Now let's go ahead and read a couple more verses. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Without natural affection, a lot of these guys, they have no affection for people. They show no joy of the Holy Spirit. They're, they're hateful and angry and mean-spirited people. They're not following the scriptures. Truth breakers, false accusers, there you go. They accuse you of falsely believing in something that you don't believe in. <laughs> You believe in three gods. No, I believe in one God, in three, and these three are one. Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, they claim, I am of God, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. We are to turn away from such people. For those people are not truly of God. They're led by seducing spirits. They're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Some of them even writing books. Oh, we ought to read my book because my book is the truth. No, the King James Bible is the truth. You are corrupt. You are resisting the truth. You're reprobate. And you need to get right with God. Their folly, it says, their folly shall be made manifest unto all men. So if you're reading your Bible, you will see their lies. Paul says, but you have fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. So he says, follow me. We need to follow Paul and his doctrine. Did Paul teach one God in three and those three are one? Yeah. Yeah, he did. He did. Verse 13, but evil man and seducer shall wax worse and worse. The devil's trying to get you to come to this side and not believe in the Trinity or come to this side and yeah, it's fine if you believe the Trinity. I don't care. Just accept my symbol of witchcraft when you do. I don't want to take either side. I want to be with the scriptures. I want to be balanced. I want to follow the Bible. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of and knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Don't depart into false doctrine. We need to know the holy scriptures because they are able to make us wise unto salvation which is through faith. You know a lot of these guys they don't preach faith gospel. They preach faith and works. No, salvation is through faith according to the Bible. So I want you to know that. Let me go to one more verse here, and I'll be done. I, I just, Folks, I love you. That's why I want to caution you and warn you about people who are heretical, who are teaching lies. I don't want you to be sucked into that cult. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. <laughs> Whose blood? God's blood. Who shed his blood? Jesus. So Jesus is God. Now it says this, For know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. They are already here. They're in YouTube. They're in our churches. They're on TV. They're all over the place. And they're trying to get you to follow them rather than the Bible. And to get away from the blessed doctrine of the true doctrine of the Trinity found in the scriptures, which is the Godhead. One God in three, and these three are one. Watch out for such people. For this, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. Not sparing the flock. Grievous wolves, it says. Let me see if I can get that highlighted. 
and also of your own selves within our own camp, if you will, own King James Bible believers. There'll be people that say, I'm a King James Bible believer. Now, let me tell you, I got the truth and these guys don't. So come on over here with me. Are you really a true King James Bible believer if you're teaching the opposite of what the King James says? Also of your own self shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Mm. Apostle Paul says, folks, I care about you and I love you and I don't want to see you fall into heresy. I'll say the same thing. I love you in the Lord. I want to see you saved, and then I want to see you grow in grace in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I do not want to see you fall into heresy and become an anti-Trinitarian. And I don't want to see you fall into a false Christianity that mixes the Trinity with a false Christian symbol. A satanic, pagan symbol that is used in witchcraft. I don't want to see that. Verse 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. My desire is to build you up. That's what we're supposed to do is edify. Edify is to build up. A lot of people out there, all they want to do is tear you down. They want to tear you a new one, they say. <laughs> and all they know how to do is come to you and make videos against people like me that all we want to do is is make sure you have the truth from a King James Bible. Now, I went a little long today, and that's fine. I had to get this out. My voice will be gone for sure tomorrow. I was going to do some more videos. I will. But I want you to know that you do not have to be ashamed if you believe in the blessed King James Bible doctrine of the Godhead. And you know you can call that the Trinity. There's nothing wrong with that. You just need to know these things and realize there are people that hate this doctrine and want to lead you astray into their side and say, come with me and believe this, because those guys are wrong. No, no. I want you to know the scriptures and know that they are the heretics, that they are the liars, that they are the deceivers, and that they are wrong. But I also don't want you to go into the other side and hook up with a false branch of Christianity that may believe in the Trinity, but yet they've mixed it with a symbol that is a satanic symbol. God forbid that you get mixed up with Satanism. But hopefully through this video you see one thing. The devil's behind it both. And the devil is attacking us on all sides. And this is not a time for us to give in to the devil and attack one another and call each other names and fight. Now more than ever, we should stand up against the devil. We should recognize what he's doing, where he's working, how he's doing it, and preach against both attacks and say, now, both are wrong. Come together in the truth for Christ. God bless you. We'll see you next time. I love you. I love you in the Lord, and I want to see you have true doctrine, and I hope you do. God bless you. We'll see you later.